So it is Father's Day, so if I didn't say it earlier, I meant to. Happy Father's Day to all the, all the dads out here. Um, I met a young father. Uh, we were on uh, vacation just a couple weeks ago, and we were at Hilton Head, and there's a little hole-in-the-wall place there called Sea Shack, and uh, you have to wait outside. They serve you food on styrofoam. It's just an awesome place. No environment whatsoever, um, but great. And so you stand in line sometimes up to an hour, hour and a half, just waiting to get in the place to order your food. And a lot of times you, you make conversation with people and it always starts out like this, you know, where else do you eat? You know, it's always about, we, man, we'll talk about food, won't we? And uh, you talk about where you're going to eat. And then, and then it's like, how many years you've been coming? So there's a young father there. And um, I say, when I say young, young is a, a, a changing target for me the older I get. But uh, I, I want to say he's about 30, maybe 32 years old. And uh, they drove from Chicago with twin eight-month-olds and a two-year-old. Yeah, that's what I said. I said, man, I said, you got it hard. I mean, <laughs> you, know, I'm, you know, I was like, that, that's hard. He goes, man, <laughs> that, I wish that. Yeah, that's nothing compared to some of the hardships we've been through. But he's smiling. He's talking to me. And so... Um, the more we talked, I could tell uh, this guy probably was a professional somewhere in Chicago. But every once in a while, he would just do something that just seemed out of character, or out of sync, you know, just body language. And then finally, the more he talked, he showed me his uncle who was living with him. He said, my uncle's living with me right now. He said, um, he said I got lymphoma. And um, he said, the only reason they allowed me to come on this trip was because we weren't flying. They said, just since y'all are driving... He said, I'm taking my medicine, and so my, if I'm doing some things that are weird, you know, I'm sorry, but the medicine's got me um, just sort of messed up a little bit. And so I'm thinking, buddy, I, I want to pray for you. Well, then they call his name, Saul, and they call his name, and he got his food, and he left. Well, then it's just another a lady and I and some other people that we'd all been sitting there, and when he walked off, we were just sort of silent. And I just made the comment, man, you never know what somebody's going through. He hired a photographer for this vacation so his kids would have pictures. You know what? It's Father's Day. And so whether you're a father or a mother or a son or a daughter, grandparent, whatever, I'm going to tell you something. Here, here's what I know to be true. You probably been through a hard time, getting ready to go through a hard time, or, or you're in a hard time. It, it, just ha it just happens. And you may even be in a, seizing, a season of, of suffering right now. Here, here's what I want to do today. I want to encourage us because we have a, and I know it just sounds like a pun, but we have a good father. Man, we, we have a great father. I, I don't know what you've been through, what you're going through, but I'm going to tell you something today. I want to encourage you because you have and I have a great father. And I want to encourage you with a statement. It's going to seem crazy, but some of you will get it. Some of you will understand it. And maybe the rest of us will be able to embrace it by the end of this message. Here's the statement. It's better to suffer and experience God's goodness. It's better to suffer and experience God's goodness and love than not to suffer at all. I knew I wouldn't get a lot of amens on that statement. But I'm telling you, it is better to suffer and experience God's goodness and love than not to suffer. Now, here's a lie that we're going to be tempted to, to believe. Where, where's God? Man, I am hurting. I am suffering. Man, where, where is God? Or, or the other one is this. Man, if he was truly good, he wouldn't let me suffer. No, I'm saying he's good because he does allow us to suffer. Church, I'm saying God is really good because he allows us to go through hard times. He allows us to go through these storms in life. And I'm saying that without suffering, we may never know how truly good and loving and comforting and wonderful God really is. This morning, uh, this morning is going to be a little bit of a, a sermon and a testimony combined. And so I want to share a little bit how good God has been to us. I'm going to tell you something right now. You're looking at a rich man. You're, you're looking at a, a blessed man. And I, I don't have a lot of material things compared to uh, the world. But I'm going to tell you something. I am rich because of what God has done and the way, what he has shown me. And so I want to bless you by showing what he is, the way he has blessed me. But I want to begin in, in Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. And it says this. Listen to this statement. 
Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith. So let that sink in. Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith. I'm telling you this morning, I mean, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, if you believe that, that God raised Jesus from the dead, you, you've confessed him as Lord and Savior, you believe that he took all your sins, I'm telling you, God looks at you and goes, man, they're right. Man, they're right with me. Man, that there is no animosity. There, there's nothing between me and that person. You are in right standing with God. Man, let that truth sink in. No more striving. No more hoping to get in. No more if I do one more thing or serve one more time. Maybe, just maybe, I'll get in by the skin of my teeth. No. Man, by faith in Christ, you and I have been made right with God. And we have peace with God because of what Jesus, our Lord, has done for us. Stop again. You and I have this peace with God. And it's not like, okay, you go your way and I'm, you know, I'll go my way and we're good. It's not what he's saying. We're right. And we have this peace that we can enjoy with our perfect Father in heaven because of what Christ has done. Not because of what you and I have done. We place our faith in Christ. So think about this. We've been made right in God's sight because of what Christ has done. We have peace with God but because of what Christ has done. Everything you and I need in this world, man, the, 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 to endure the hard times, the, the wisdom to know what to do, the, the guidance of the Spirit, man, we have everything we need in this relationship with God because we have access to the Father. Listen to what he says. Because of our faith, this almost, almost sounds like somebody has been loved on so much they're embarrassed to talk about it. You know, wives, you know what I'm talking about? No, that's a joke. <laughs> so, but because of our faith, here's what he says. Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege. It's almost like Paul is like, I, I can't believe this. This is so incredible. For almost, because of what he's done for us and how he loves us. We've been brought into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand. And we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. This is a mind-blowing set of sentences that Paul is laying out for us. And, but listen to this next statement. If that's not enough to rejoice, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. For we know they help us to develop, develop endurance. And diver, endurance develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment. For we know how dearly God loves us because he's given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. Paul's gushing. <laughs> I mean, he, he is gushing because of all Christ has done for us. The, the four previous chapters were like bad news, but now all of a sudden he's talking about what Christ has done for us. And then he says we can rejoice when we face problems and trials. He's even saying those problems and trials, they're going to help you. They're going to create endurance and, and strength and strength of character. And then he, he says this. It leads to a confident hope of salvation that will not lead to disappointment. Think about the other type of hope. Or think about where we place our hope on, on earthly things. How many times have you placed your hope on, 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 on people or, or situations? So this is going to be a little bit of a, a testimony today to talk about how good God's been. But I need to give you a little bit of a, a, a backstory. So if you're new here, we, we um, have four biological kids. They're, they're 30 and 27 and 25 and, and 17, which that's crazy. That's, I got like three sets of kids. I got the three older kids. I got the 17-year-old. That's 6'5". 
where'd he come from, you know? And, and, then, I, and then we have two adopted boys, Cage and, and Trenton, and Trenton's 10 and, and Cage is, is seven. I mean, Cage is 10 and Trenton. When you got six, you're just lucky to get their names right, you know? And so you got Cage's 10 and, and Trenton's seven. And so they, they, these two both have special needs. Not, I think all teenagers have been their mind. But anyway, and so Cage um, especially has more needs than Trenton, even though Trenton is in, in a wheelchair and is, um, he's not paraplegic, but he, he, he can't control his limbs. So Cage has been having seizures and not just seizures. He's just been having one difficulty after another and one problem after another. And so his whole life, we've, we've gone to specialists. This specialist will have the answer. And here's the message we get. You know what? Cage is a complicated kid. We get in with another specialist. You know, and you know what? We're meeting there. No, hey, you know what? We did all this testing. Cage is a complicated kid. Hope shattered. There's a new medicine out. We try the new medicine, only to add more medicines, to up the medicine, to get more medicine that doesn't work. And we hear this again. If I've heard it once, I've heard it, I'm, in, no, I'm not lying, probably 20 times. Hey, Cut Cage is a complicated kid. Got a lot going on. I put my hope so many times on the next appointment, the next doctor's visit, the next medication. So let me give you a... Let me bring it forward a little bit to January 16th. I always say January 16th because that's when a tree fell in our house. That's when the blizzard came through. Remember the blizzard when we canceled services? Yeah, it was so deep. Nobody could drive. It was terrible. Um, but a tree at 8.30 fell in my house. And I remember someone going, are you upset about that? I went, that's nothing. Insurance, that's, that's nothing, you know. Well, later that afternoon, I had COVID symptoms, which uh, crazy and went through the family. Next week, Tracy rolls her ankle. If one of us goes down, it's hard. I'm just saying. Now, let me say this too. There's people going through a lot harder things than us. So I'm not saying at all that this is the hardest thing in the world. There's people going through a lot harder than us. I'm just telling you our story. Next week, Cage, who only has one strong leg, broke that leg at the trampoline park. Now you're going places. You got two kids in wheelchairs. You talk about getting some crazy looks when you go places, when you're pushing two kids in wheelchairs. People don't know what to say. <laughs> yeah, it's just awkward. I got so many stories about that. One day we have more time, I'll tell you. Um, Cage's seizures are are growing increasingly out of control where we don't want another brain surgery. We did brain surgery back in 2020 before COVID broke out. We didn't want another surgery. And then one Sunday I'm here, I get a text between services that he's non-responsive. And so I had to leave immediately and, and meet them at the hospital. And then a stomach bug uh, runs through our house. And I remember laying in bed saying, God, what are you trying to teach me? What's going on? And I started thinking about where I've been placing my hope. Specialists, new meds, new therapies, this season. I'm hoping this season will just hurry up and pass. You ever had that hope? Hey, I just hope I'll get through this quickly, God. And I'm telling you what I learned. Jesus is more than enough. I, I learned it actually before I got the stomach bug. And so if you're a first time guest, you may never come back after I give this illustration. But I remember by this time, I'm, I'm just like, I will do anything not to throw up. I will do anything. I don't want to throw up. I mean, I was like, all right, whatever. I went and just lay back down, you know. But I learned Jesus is more than enough. And the stomach bug and the trees and the, all that stuff. And you know what I also learned? Jesus never disappoints. He never disappoints. Man, during that whole season of, of being down, uh, you know, physically down and, and being contemplative and, and thinking, God, what are you trying to teach me? I have everything I need in Jesus. I'm telling you, I learned I have everything I need in Jesus. Well, the, the remaining four weeks before Cage went into surgery... He just recently, had, if you're new, he just recently had another brain surgery. Um, he is out of his cast where he broke his leg, but atrophy set in so bad and it, bad and his, um, 
good leg, and of course his weak leg was already weak. It was even worse. He predominantly was in a wheelchair um, going into to the hospital. Now, I did take some time off, as you know, for, for the brain surgery and the recovery. So now I want to tell you a little bit about that. First day in the hospital, they insert six rods into his brain. And so what they do is they, in two, three different areas, that two went into where his memory is, two went into where his mobility is, and two went into where his speech is. And what they would do is, while he's awake, okay, um, they would sedate him. Here's actually a picture of what he, he looked like. Um, that's him. He's, he cannot take a serious picture to save his life. Somebody, one of you bought that blanket and had it sent to us. We don't know who it was. There was no name or anything. So if you're here today, that blanket's just covered in scripture. Okay, so thank you for doing that. Um, but that's Cage. So that wrap he has on his head, so there's on, the, on the, his left side, there's six rods, two, two, and two, and they're touching that. And so the plan was um, we were going to test him and, and give a small electrical impulse to each one, and if it interfered with mobility or memory, Tracy and I had a choice. Do you still want to do the surgery? We, didn't want to have to, we did not want to have to answer that question. The other two rods went into where his speech was. If it interfered with speech at all, they, then they make the decision we're not doing it because those kids, when they lose their ability to speak, even at the expense, even at the plus of not having seizures anymore, they get extremely depressed and um, they've seen horrific things happen with those kids in their lives. And so they were going to make that decision. So, but before we get to that testing, he also has, because uh, it looks like he's got a 220 cable coming out of the top of his head. He's got um, all these EEG leads on him. And so he's got a, uh, you can't really see it, but there's like a huge uh, wrapped cable coming out of the top of his head. And then he's got his leads on his chest and on his back. He's got an IV um, in here. And so if you know Cage at all, Cage had to sit in that bed for eight days straight, a 10 year old boy. Now, and he's autistic and he's got a lot of, We'll call it spunk. <laughs> All we did for eight days was untangle this boy. I, I, I'm not even lying. I mean, it was, I mean, I mean, my, my chair, you can't see my chair, but using my chair, or, or if Tracy's there, her chair's right there beside him because you're just getting up and you're just untangling him. That's all we did for eight days. So that was day, uh, that was first day in, that's what happened. Now, the plan was I was going to stay two or three nights and then Tracy would, would stay a night. And the reason being, he does better for me with the autism. And so we were both there during the day, and then, you know, she would go home more often than I would. On day two, she gets back, and I've been, you know, nobody sleeps at the hospital. I get up, she gets there, we talk about the night, we talk about home. I said, I'm getting out of here, I got to get some coffee, you know. And God put a Starbucks there in the lobby, unbelievable. I go outside, and I'm just getting some fresh air, and my mom's walking back and forth, and and so after she got off the phone, I just said, hey, what are you here for? And she said, I got a 10-year-old son who's having seizures. It just started last night. I'm thinking, well, I got a son that has seizures. I can speak to this, you know. And so she tells me about it. And I say, hey, I want to pray for him. What is his name? She says, name's Samson. I'm thinking, Samson? I, don't even, I know Samson in the Bible, and I know a dog named Samson. I've never met anybody named Samson. And I said, well, I'm going to pray for Samson. She says, well, Hey, I got another son who's seven, and he has MS. I said, what's his name? She says, Solomon. I went, Samson and Solomon? Like strength and wisdom? She said, yeah. I said, all right, well, I'm, I'm praying. The next day, I get a voice message from a friend of mine's son who's on a mission trip right now. And he says, Scott, I was praying for you and Tracy. And the Spirit revealed some things to me. And I thought, oh, buddy, I've been in this situation before. These things never work out good. You know. And he said, I, I, I'm praying. And he said, the, the part that was a vision, he said, there was a, a woman in scrubs, a grandmother in scrubs. And she's going to be a source of comfort for y'all. And I'm, and I'm listening to this message in the cafeteria like this. I'm like, oh, no, no, no. He said, and the more I prayed about it, it's really not a woman in scrubs. But there's something there at the hospital that is going to be a source of comfort to you. And 
So he said, then he said, and the Lord will show you, you'll figure it out. And I went, if I got to figure it out, man, I don't know about this. I leave them, and I'm going back, I'm back in the lobby, and there's a mom there who has dwarfism, and she and I strike up a conversation, and, um, you know, what are you here for? And she said, my son's going to have a shunt put in. And I said, Cage has a shunt, I can, I can speak to that. So I'm walking with her, and now I'm getting ready to go in the elevator, and she's getting ready to go down the hallway for you know where her son is. I said, hey, hey, what, what's your son's name? She said, my son's name is Silas. I went, Samson Solomon is Silas? And now the elevator doors are shut. I'm praying. I'm like, well, God, what are you? So get back to the room. Tracy leaves. We do the whole untangle stuff for a couple of hours. Cage goes to sleep. I started to think, well, I know these stories. I thought, no, you go back to the scriptures. You go back to the scriptures. So as I'm looking at Samson in the scriptures, and we know that God gave him incredible strength. He was not a perfect man by any means. If anything, he's known to be very imperfect. But God chose him. I'm thinking, God, is that me? And I said, the more I'm praying about it, no. It's Dr. Churn. It's, it's all these nurses. It's all these staff. Think about what they did. They put rods through my son's skull and touching his brain in three different places. As, and he's talking and playing games and stuff and all that's happening. And they were able to deduce, could he have this surgery? They knew exactly where the seizures were. And they were able to know exactly what part of the brain to cut out to where it wouldn't even affect his daily living other than give him a better quality of life. Yeah, that's definitely them. Well, then Solomon... I automatically thought wisdom. But I thought, what does his name mean? His name means peace. It's a form of shalom. And I want to tell you something. The moment we got there. Now, we've had kids with open heart surgery. We've had kids with, you know, emergency intestinal surgery. And this is Cage's second brain surgery. We had a peace and look, a lot of y'all are part of it for all the prayers. It was, it was so almost tangible that Tracy and I would go, can, can, you, can you believe this peace God's given us? It was unbelievable. During surgery, one of my older sons uh, came to, to comfort us, and we're comforting him. And we've got this peace and, and this joy that was just Unbelievable. Well, then I went to Silas. And Silas is known for, you know, um, you know, he and Paul are ministering and they get thrown in jail. And they're praising God and singing hymns to God. And the jail doors are opened. They're known for their faith in God in, in incredible hard times. I, I want to back up and I'm going to pick this up pretty quickly. Back up two weeks prior to going to the hospital, he had to have a sedated MRI and he had to have a, uh, a CT scan done at, at 2 o'clock on a Friday afternoon at two, top of 285. And I was like, oh my God, I got to get there and get out. That was my mindset. Get in, been here, done that, get in, get out, beat the traffic. That was my mindset. Um, and so we get in there, and man, that's their mindset too. They want to get home. It's Friday. We get there, and we do our thing, and everything goes great, and we're ready to go at 4.15. I am in go mode. I am trying to get Kay's dress. He is fighting me. And the reason being, he has my phone because he knows when he goes to the hospital, he can have my phone, and he's been showing pictures of people and calling people, and probably a lot of you, and I'm sorry, but he, he just is doing it constantly, and and he does it, and so he's fighting me. Well, the discharge nurse, she had come in, and she went over the discharge instructions. And after about five minutes, I'm still wrestling with him, and I realize she's still talking. I'm like, what is she talking about? Why isn't she helping me? No, I'm just kidding. Why, what was she talking about? Then I'm convicted. She's giving Tracy and I praise that belongs to Jesus. See, whenever we go in the hospital, Kay's just my phone. 
And he starts showing pictures of, of Jacob, Cameron, and Trevor, and Nathan, his biological brothers. And the first thing they notice is, whoa, they're old. And then he shows them pictures of his, his uh, biological brothers and sisters. And, of course, they have questions. And then we just answer their questions. And, and you can't talk about them without talking about Jesus. You, you can't talk about it. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, she's given. If she only knew how selfish I was, I hadn't even been listening to her for the last five minutes. And then, so, I'm, I'm, Lord, forgive me. Lord, forgive me. And then um, I've got to re enter this conversation. I said, ma'am, everything you see, this is because we asked the Lord and the Lord did this. Oh, I believe, I believe in God. I'm like, no, 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 no. And then I realized I was going into the hospital. We thought it was all about Cage getting seizure free. See, the God cares about his seizures. But it was more about God's glory and God's witness and him being seen. It was about our testimony. And it was about his seizures. Our hospital, we were being um, videoed. I don't know if you call it video, but 24-7, you know, the whole time we were in ICU. Uh, one day, Jacob and Trevor came by, and um, they were visiting with him on a Sunday afternoon, and Cage, anyway, being Cage, and um, he ends up having a seizure while they're there. And we've been praying for seizures because he wouldn't have them. Having them all the time to get to the hospital. It's like that car that makes that noise until you get to the hospital, you know, until you get to the garage. But he has a seizure, and the staff sees the concern that Jacob and Trevor have for him. And they see the love that he has for them. And they see this, they see just our family. Just doing what we do, and it's crazy. There's things I can't tell you because it's not sin. It's just inappropriate to talk about. But it's cage. You know? And later that day, this lady came in, the nurse, whose name was Rachel. Another biblical name. And if you know anything about Rachel and Jacob, they were the first romantic story in Scripture, and they comforted one another. She said, she was talking about the boys. And she said, man, what a testimony to Jesus. Man, that was our prayer. That was our prayer. Now, God had to get me to that point. Cage had surgery on Tuesday, April 26. And so this is his first picture after surgery. Well, that's been up there a long time. That was right after surgery. He had the sweetest words for when he woke up in the OR. He said, get out. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so we stayed in ICU nine days. Most of that really was just because he was on a heavy sedation prior to surgery and then two days. But then, then this is him after the swelling set in a um, couple of days after surgery. And that was him for several days. And then the next picture, you can change that quickly. All right. And this is when we're getting ready to leave ICU. Okay. And go down to the floor. And so we're getting ready to leave to go down to the floor. And this uh, PA who had been in ICU the whole time, he, he would come in. Cage called him a knucklehead on the first day. And, um, and so he would always say, hey, knucklehead's here, you know, and he would do that. And then they, they would have their rapport, you know. And um, uh, anyway, I said, hey, man, I want to thank you. I never got your name. Man, what's your name? He went, Noah. I'm like, oh, my God. Yeah, I'll take you. You got a vision for me? I'll take it, you know. And so I went back to the scriptures that night. Noah's name means rest. That hospital stay. And I'm incredible. Rest in the Lord. I'm telling you, I felt like we were just healed. 
the whole time. Now, look, there was, there was moments, especially after surgery, of being up all night because of, he had severe headaches and vomiting and uh, we were untangling him and all that kind of stuff. But I'm going to tell you, spiritually, we rested. He comforted us. Physically exhausting. I fell asleep on I-20, a car behind me as I swerved into the next lane, blew its horn, woke me up. As we were coming home one day, you know, it was when it was my turn. But even now, he's given me physical rest. So this is his cage now. This is a pig from two weeks ago at the, at the beach. Yeah. And... Uh, I told myself I wasn't going to get choked up. But this Tuesday, he'll be eight weeks seizure-free. No seizures. <laughs> so the last few months for us has been one of the longest seasons of suffering we've been through. Not, not as bad as most. People have had it much worse than us. But I would not trade it for anything in the world. I'm telling you. I have seen the comfort of God. I have seen the goodness of God. I've walked and rested in the peace of God. And I wouldn't trade it. I am one of the richest men you'll ever see. All because of what God has done. I would not trade it. So I believe it's better to suffer and and experience God's goodness and love than not to suffer. I'll take it again. I'll take it again. Man, I have tasted and seen the Lord's good. I've seen it. And we didn't walk through this alone. Man, y'all have been amazing. The prayers, the cards, the meals, the gifts, all, all that. But I know this. There are greater accounts of suffering than ours. And it's much more severe. And I don't know what you're going through. But I'm telling you, we can rejoice in suffering because he has promised to deliver us from them. I want you to see Psalm 34, 19. The righteous person. If we go back to Romans, we, we were made righteous through our faith in God. Not because of what we did. Man, we're, we're filthy. Uh, I mean, apart from Christ, we're just filthy. But because of our faith in Christ, we're righteous. And then David says the righteous person faces many troubles. But the Lord comes to the rescue each time. The Lord comes to the rescue each time. So this Father's Day, this day, man, what's your suffering? Man, what's your hardship? Here's what I know to be true. Hardship is a pathway to peace. I'm telling you right now, accept it. Like the serenity prayer says, man, accept that hardship as a pathway to peace. Follow Jesus in it. Man, look for where he is. Because I'll tell you what's, I'll tell you what's hard What's hard is not following Jesus and doing life and trying to figure it all out on on your own. That's what's hard. But I want to say this morning to you, man, God's power is available to you. Man, God's peace, man, that's available to you. Man, that faith to walk through that storm, man, that's available to you. His rest I'm telling you, it's available to you. And so this morning, I, I, I want us to do this. That the band's going to lead us in song and talk about the goodness of God. Man, if you would like for me to, to pray with you, man, I would love to pray with you. Man, if you're just going through it, I just, I want to minister you in that way. And but maybe you don't need to do that. Can I tell you what you do need to do? Then you need to praise God. You need to praise God for his goodness. So we're going to stand. Again, if you would like for me to, to pray with you, I, I'm going to be right here. And if you, you know what, we've got two of our elders over here, and I'm sure they would pray with you too as well. But if you don't need prayer right now, then you have a need to praise him. You have a need to praise him.